name is Gail Baker. I'm the town manager here in Clarkton. I'd just like to welcome you all. Thank you for coming. We're hoping that it will be an educational, informative meeting tonight. Uh, we've got presentations from a number of folks that are up here, so I'll run through really quickly so that we keep the meeting moving along and the presentations moving along. I'll introduce everyone. Um, actually, as we go, we'll introduce folks and that will keep things moving a little more quickly. So I'm going to jump right in. Well, actually, a little perspective. This is a new type of meeting for us. Um, some of you have lived here in Clarkdale or near Clarkdale for a long time. And I've heard tonight, hey, we've never had a meeting like this. We just wanted to take the opportunity, given some of the projections and forecasts, and lots of talk about El Nino and what that could mean for flooding instances in particular, to just uh, visit with folks in the community, talk about what we do as a the town and the fire district, the sheriff's office, county emergency management to get ready for any types of emergencies, but in, tonight we're really focusing on flood events. Um, and share information about what you can do as individual citizens to have your own uh, preparedness in case of emergency impacting your home or your neighborhood. So that's kind of the background. Um, we're going to go through, as I said, a series of presentations. Mine will be probably the quickest. Um, Fire Chief Joe Moore is going to talk to you about that disaster preparedness for your own family. And then our Community and Economic Development Director, Jody Filardo, is going to talk about our floodplain maps, how those have changed, things about uh, FEMA and flood insurance. And I, I know that a lot of folks are interested in that. I've heard some questions about that already. Uh, then our Police Chief, Randy Taylor, is going to talk to you about, um, for Clarkdale specifically, evacuation procedures, uh, especially for the low-lying areas along the river in Clarkdale and some other um, potential emergency routes in Clarkdale for flooded areas. And then for those of you that live outside of Clarkdale, we've also got folks from the Sheriff's Office that will be talking to you about evacuation in those areas as well. Then Janet Carey, our Community Services Director, is going to talk to you just about how information flows during an event. Janet serves as our Public Information Officer during emergencies, so communicating during emergencies is an important and we want you to be keyed in on that. Then Kathy Bainbridge is our town clerk and finance director. And Kathy's going to talk to you about basically after an emergency or after a disaster, what happens, what's the recovery process for the community and how that impacts you as property owners. Then Ron Slotman from the Yavapai County Emergency Management Department is going to talk to you about what the county does as part of emergency planning and the resources they provide. And then Lieutenant Martin from the Yakima County Sheriff's Office will be speaking with you about evacuations, about emergency notification, and the county's code red system, and other things. And then we'll open it up for questions and discussion from any of you folks. So with that said, I'm going to run really quickly. This little graphic is a graphic that depicts the emergency management cycle, and you're going to see this a couple of times tonight. That emergency management cycle is really four phases. The first being prevention and mitigation, and then preparedness. So tonight is part of what we do as part of preparedness, talking, doing planning our own selves, and then talking with the public about preparedness. The third stage is response. So actually in an emergency, the actual physical response when something happens, and then the recovery process, which Kathy's going to talk about at the end. I wanted to spend just a very briefly and a clarification. I'm not a weather forecaster. I've never claimed to be one, and we all know how accurate those are. But you've heard lots of talk about El Nino and what that could do, what impacts that could have. And just a couple of quick points about El Nino. El Nino doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have these great big storms. It just predicts that on average, you'll have more storms, and we're seeing that play out this winter. Today is an exception. So that we didn't have a cloudy, rainy day today, but we've had a lot of those this winter already. So our, the storms are coming more frequently. There's an enhanced risk of heavy snow loads up in the high country in particular, and we'll, we'll look at some of that statistics in a minute. And then as a result of that, increased wear on your community infrastructure, so roads tend to degrade more because you're getting more moisture, more free. 
and then threat of high water for rivers, creeks, and streams. So again, as I said, not necessarily big storms, but more frequent storms during an El Nino cycle. It also doesn't mean that we'll necessarily be colder than normal, although I feel like it's colder than normal, and some weather experts say it's colder than normal. The official temperature forecasts are that it's relatively normal temperatures through this El Nino, just predicting more rainfall. And then this is the seasonal temperature outlook that I just referenced. You can see Arizona there kind of between the two bands, and what that's indicating is that they're during this El Nino cycle, they are saying that the seasonal temperatures should be pretty close to normal, and that's for February, March, and April. That was just updated last week. And then the next slide is the precipitation outlook, and as you can see in Arizona, depending on where you are, they're projecting a 40 to 50 percent higher probability of increased precipitation, again, from that February, March, and April time frame. This is the most current data on snow pack in Prescott and Flagstaff. So you can see that this is from October 1st through January 21st, comparing this year to the average snowfall. So in Flagstaff, year-to-date snowfall has been 61.5 inches, and the average is 46.6. .6. So that's, quick math, uh, about 15 inches of uh, 15 inches more snowfall than the average winter in Flagstaff and five inches more in Prescott. So that just gives you a little bit of perspective about what the forecasts are for El Nino, what, what that may or may not mean for us, and I'm going to hand the microphone over to Chief Moore. <coughs> Let him take his part of the presentation. Thank you, Gail. Um, first of all, I'd like to just thank all of you for coming time tonight to be here for this information. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the efforts of everybody to, to put this together. So let me get, thank you guys for being here. So from the fire district perspective, uh, I've been tasked with, you know, setting up, helping you to, to, to create a, a family emergency plan. So if this disaster happens, some of you folks live in the, in the floodplain zone. Some folks live to the northern sector where you could be cut off out on Sycamore Canyon. There's some different things there that, uh, that you need to take into consideration. So my discussion is more about making the family plan and if you were going to stay probably in place and considering what you need in your home for your family and what all that looks like to, to have an emergency preparedness kit, if you will. And I'm going to discuss the 72-hour kit. And uh, how many people know how much water you should have for one person for one day? Three gallons. Three gallons. Wow. You're talking water, you're talking sanitation, you're talking everything that you might need just in case your water's out, things of that nature. So, water, medication, all that. Now, I'm going to hold up some pamphlets to show you those, but for you folks, all the pamphlets I'm going to show are, are provided for you that uh, we put together. Most of these were, actually I believe all of these were, were gathered from, uh, from the FEMA website. And we all kind of share that. I noticed that uh, when I looked at YCSO's website, they have the www.ready.gov. You can go there for this stuff and you can get it free. Um, so, the first one I want to start with is preparing makes sense, get ready now. Okay, and in this, yeah, just, we'll, we'll stop this one for just a second. Um, the things that you want to consider, it's actually one gallon of water per person per day for drinking sanitation. Food, battery-powered radio with extra batteries, flashlight, first aid kit. Whistle the signal for help. I mean, if you have no phone or no ability or cell phone's out or tower's out or whatever, you know, you might need the whistle to let somebody know in the, in the neighborhood that can get help for you. So, wet towelettes, things of that nature. If you've got kids, infants and formula need to be considered. So, in this pamphlet, that stuff discusses it and everything for the family plan. And in the back, it has the family communication plan. Um, social security numbers, medications, date of birth of folks, important numbers and things to know like, you know, what the home address is, what the work address is, because you can be separated. The flood could happen during a time where half the families at work or in school and the other half's at home or, or that situation. So separate, so you didn't know all these things where they're at. Some really important other documents to have in your plan, you know, who's, uh, or to protect, I should say. We'll 
it'll come up more in the slides here in a little bit. But like your homeowner's insurance, your deeds, your birth certificates, things of that nature. Put them in plastic bags, protect them, take them with you, have them with you. It's, um, I'm going to go back to this, making a family pay, your, your family may not all be together when the disaster strikes. Again, the kids could be in school, somebody, you know, mom could be at, 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 at home, and they're cut off between us. So it's important to prepare in case that happens. Go ahead. So as part of your plan, some of the questions you need to be asking yourself. How will your family or household get emergency alerts and warnings? Well, one of the things I mentioned was an emergency radio with extra batteries. Does anybody have a crank radio? Has anybody ever seen a crank radio? Okay, we've got a few in the audience that have seen it. So this is, and I'm not promoting Red Cross, I just happened to pick this one up. Uh, this particular one, it's got a few extras to it now that we're a little further ahead in, in, uh, in technology. Of course, it has the MFM digital radio, it has a NOAA weather band alerts, because we want to know specifically we're talking about flood, and we're not meteorologists, so good to know what's up on that. USB smartphone charger. Gosh, if, you're, if your electricity's out, power's out, wouldn't it be nice to have an extra power source to take care of that? Hand crank power we talked about, but what's really cool is right on top is a solar strip. If you manage to have a sunshiny day like a beautiful day like we did today, you don't have to crank it so much. You got the solar strip to charge the battery to keep your cell phone charged. It has LED flashlights, which obviously don't take the battery down. Um, as much headphone jack, blow in the dark, things of that nature. So, anybody want to take a look at it, pass it around? That's about a $60 item. So, that one's important to find out, getting alerts, and, and stay informed. How's your family members or the household going to get to safe location for relevant emergencies? Okay, escape routes or alternative routes. And that's something. Chief Randy Taylor's going to speak to you later as far as uh, some of the folks about some of the alternative routes you guys might need to consider, but you need to have that in your plan. How many different other ways is there to get from the relevant area of danger or flood out? Um, so, how do you get in touch? You know, if the, if the cell phone's out, the internet's out, landline doesn't work, well, that's probably a bad thing. You probably have to be patient, wait for stuff to, to maybe get fixed. It, you know, get your crank phone going, get your cell phone charged up, and, and may have to be patient, things will come back online, but again, that may happen, so uh, not to panic on that. How will I let loved ones know I'm safe? Uh, again, in that plan is a phone list, and in that phone list it speaks to specifically setting phone numbers, so if you're here and you have an emergency situation, but you want a central family member, I don't know, I mean, I, I've got a brother that, he knows what we're all doing. I don't know how he does most of the time, but he's the informant, and he would be the guy that I'm going to say, hey, call him if you want to know how I'm doing or what I'm doing. That's part of your emergency plan. Have somebody else in, in the loop so we know there's somebody else we can contact. Make sure you're okay. Um, that's how you let loved ones know you're safe. And then uh, you might want to consider your plan a household to a, a meeting place, you know, after the emergency. Um, if you're still separated, you can get together and there's a point where you, you have that ability to get together. What, what, what would be that emergency meeting place like Starbucks? Or, you know, whatever. But pick a, pick a place. Make that part of your plan. Okay, recommended uh, items include the basic emergency supply kit. Keeping in mind when you're seeing this, this is talking about any emergency. This could be earthquake, volcano, because you're going to see dust passed in there. Things of that nature. Specifically for us, it's floods. But the first aid kit, the flashlight, extra batteries, battery powered crank radio, just go around and take a look at. Whistle to, to call for help makes a lot of sense. Dust mask, help filter contaminated air, plastic sheeting and duct tape shelter in place. That might be more a case of if you're out on the road and you got stranded on the road and you need a shelter in place type thing. Not necessarily so much for the flood situation. But again, these are really important things. Ranch and pliers, turn off utilities, can opener, obviously to open food. And when you talk about the water, you also need non-perishable food for 72 hours. What do you like to eat that comes in a can? <laughs> Not much everything, okay. But keep into consideration, that might be all you get to eat for that 72 hours while you're waiting to flood waters to recede. You can get into town, actually get food, situations of that nature. So it's really, really important to make sure you've got some supplies so that you can shelter in place. That's specifically what I'm talking about, more shelter in place and, and what you're going to do in your emergency plan for that shelter in place. So again, that list is in a lot of this documentation. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. This one's additional.
additional items to consider. This one's really, really a little more pertinent to, to what I do in the, in the, in the fire and AMS section. This is one of the better, if you will, one of the better pamphlets back there. And it has both the list that you look at, the first list and now the second list on it. So, you know, this is the big list, which is the food, water, all that stuff. But, as we know, some folks are on medication. Um, specifically, and there's a pamphlet in here that speaks to folks that want to prepare that have diabetes. Folks that need insulin at a regular base, regular time, things of that nature. So if you're somebody that, uh, if it looks like, or we've got the potential in the next couple of months to have a flood disaster situation, if you could stock up on your medications, make sure you're, you're, you're well stocked with that. Again, infant formulas and, and diapers, things of that nature. The family important, and family documents, uh, money's good to have. Sleeping bag, warm blanket. Obviously, if the power goes out, the heat goes out, something to consider. How are you going to keep yourself warm? So making sure you have the, you know, the extra blankets one. Obviously, most of you folks are going to be sheltering in place in your home. You're not sheltering in your car or out in a cold weather road situation. But if you are, some of this is speaking to that too. Make sure you get stuff to keep yourself warm if you don't have the ability to have that. So some of the other stuff you've got to consider. How many of you folks are all well? Anybody all well? So we've got a few well folks. What happens when the power goes out? No water. Now, I'm going to share both sides of this. Our wastewater guys in here. You don't have water, but let's say if you got a well, well, maybe you've got a septic tank. If you've got a septic tank, well, if you store water, you can still use your toilet, and things are still good. But, again, keep in mind, because you have that well situation, you might want to already stock up and have water stored. Don't wait for the emergency to happen, or right until the time, you might want to get that water stored and whatnot. Even to the point you can consider filling a bathtub, have an extra water for sanitary purposes and whatnot, but also those of you have a septic tank, you could end up using that to flush the toilets. You got something to fill the toilet with, so you still have that amenity. So again, part of the preparedness. Now on the other side, for those of you folks that are on municipal water, even though the power might be out, the system may still be backed up and working, you still have water. But my concern now, those of you that are on the septic system, or on the, I'm sorry, the the uh, sanitary system, the sewer system. Now, I think, Wayne, correct me if I'm wrong, it'd take a few days of using that without having that system working before we'd have a backup. Is that true? Uh, we have two pump stations. We have emergency procedures to use a generator to operate them for the okay. cycle, so we would be able to keep the system up. So good. You, you just make my heart feel a lot better at the fire station that our sewer's not going to back up. So that's a, that's a good thing. So there's lots of backup plans for, for his in place. But, if that wasn't uh, the case, or if something went down on Waynesdale, again, the emergency notification stuff, the radio stuff, the, the, the stuff the sheriff would be talking about with uh, Code Red, you need to keep on base on what's going on, because if anything's bad or the water's contaminated or any of that type of stuff, they're going to notify you and let you know. So, again, it's great to have that communication beyond Code Red. I'm not going to steal Lieutenant Martin's thunder because it's a phenomenal thing. I hope everybody signs up for that so that if you're not signed up. One last thing that I think is really important to consider, there's multiple packages back there from folks that have uh, elderly folks to take care of, diabetes and disease processes, folks that don't have, um, you know, we've got some folks that, that may be a wheelchair. Inaccessibility, that's where the fire department, police department come in if they need help evacuating stuff, which, you know, later on you talk about that, that stuff, we may need help you with. So it'd be good to know that. I don't know about you guys, I got three pugs and a German Shepherd. All my kids are out of the house. These are my kids. So they're important to me. So again, keep in mind that if you've got small pets and animals and you're going to shelter in place, make sure you've got, for those that have medication, I have a, my, my, my in-laws have a dog that's a diabetic and has to take insulin. And again, something to consider, make sure you've got the, the medications, the food, the water, everything for the animals. So all of that's in here as well. Please feel free to take any and all pamphlets that are back there, and, uh, and and just get yourself ready, get prepared. Thank you for being here. Did I miss it, Jody. Jody. Okay, my name is Jody Filardo. I'm the Community and Economic Development Director, and I'm going to walk you through how we came to figure out who in Clarkdale may be at risk. So you all may have heard of. FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and you may remember back in Katrina days, FEMA got in some hot water, really wasn't the beloved.
loved agency that they could be because of emergency preparedness. They are responsible for emergency preparedness and mitigating against hazards for both citizens and first responders. And one of the things they also do on behalf of the entire nation is they give us definitions with which to work. Several of us were gathered over by the flood maps that you see over here on my right, your left, that what FEMA helps us do is define terms so we can all be talking the same language. So flood way is the water course and adjacent lands next to it. Flood plain is the center of that, and that is the most likely to flood. What I'm going to talk you through is sort of how we figured out in Clarkdale where we have flooding issues. Some of us who've lived here for a while know where we have flooding issues because we've had them before. But one of the things that happens is FEMA, as the federal agency, then turns to the counties and says, who wants to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program? Our Yavapai County said, you know, we want to participate in that because we think we've got flooding issues here, and in fact, we do. So they actually provide floodplain management for the entire county. What that means is that they keep an eye on all the flooding throughout Yavapai County, and they also are in charge of creating local maps. I don't know how many of y'all participated in the most recent mapping program that Yavapai County Flood Control District did, but it, <laughs> it resulted, well the timing was good, it resulted in the flood risk management plan for our area, and that includes some of Clarkdale. So in the, one of the four maps in the flood risk management plan, you can see there's a little bit of Clarkdale kind of in the heart of this north central area, as you know. But one of the things that the Yavapai County Flood Control District does is they identify the 100-year flood line and then the 500-year flood line. What 100-year flood line means is that within 100 years we can expect a flood to that particular area and every 500 years then we could expect a flood to the other area, the broader area. That does not mean that you can have two 500-year floods back to back, but it's not highly likely based on what they, are they, their risk assessment for hazard. So what we do with that Yavapai County Flood Control District information and the FEMA information is we in Clarkdale build maps. And that's where some of this comes from. We have a GIS analyst who is also our videographer tonight. And Gus creates these maps for us so that our team knows where to go to find people who may be at risk for flood impact in our community. And actually, these new maps are brand new as of 2015. I don't know if any of y'all participated in those public meetings that Yellowby County Flood Control District had. But what we saw for changes in Clarkdale in the new maps is that the area up by um, Yavapai College and the Mescal Wash that runs behind those areas, those, that flood area actually shrank. And the reason it shrank is because neighbors said, hey, there's been a flood control project down at the crossroads of Mingus subdivision where they built that nifty Gabian wash system down there. And that really mitigated the flood concerns that were further south in the Mescal Wash. So FEMA actually shrunk that flood area in that area. Along the Verde River, there were some minor adjustments, but by and large, that area did not change. So there are several other things that this risk management plan tells us about. One of the things you all may have thought about already is, what about our one-lane bridge down here at Broadway? And you're going to hear more about that tonight, the evacuation plans that the Chief has considered some of these risks and mitigations. Of course, we've got flooding potential down on Rincon and closer to the river. We also have some other areas of concern, actually, in the southern part of Clarkdale in the foothills because we've got low river, low water crossing areas that can flood. Um, and we're also going to be talking about barricades that could potentially
potentially go up in case of flooding in those areas as well. But you'll hear more from the chief on that in just a minute. So in Clarkdale, we presently have 24 Clarkdale properties who are participating in the National Flood Insurance Program. For those of you with mortgages who are in the flood plain or flood way, your mortgage company likely told you, we won't give you a mortgage unless you take out flood insurance. And that's to protect you from loss of property, loss of life, and everything else. But if you are interested in flood insurance, you don't have a mortgage, so nobody required that of you to take possession of your home, and you're interested in flood insurance, the place to go is www.floodsmart.gov. And there's a whole raft of information on there on what is flood insurance, what will it cover, how do you obtain it. And that is your first point of engagement on flood insurance. So with that, I'd like to turn this over to Chief Taylor for some evacuation discussion. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I want to kind of uh, give you an overview of, of what happens in the yellow section here. So in the, in the yellow section, you see we're moving around this direction. In the yellow section, I want you to know that that's not just a section where all of a sudden we go to red and we're, we're, um, we're in a disaster stage. <clears throat> that's not, hopefully, um, as compared to in years past, there's enough information out there, there's, a, there's enough um, we have we have the resources now to determine uh, early on, if, hopefully, that there's going to be in the, in the uh, event of a flood, there's something that's going to be happening. And so, what will happen in those in that stage? Um, it won't be up to myself. It would be up to um, the emergency uh, planner for the for the county, for the sheriff's department, myself, and um, Chief Moore. We'll be getting together and trying to make a determination on just how serious the the flood, if, if, if we're talking about water, um, is, is going to be, what it looks like, and what parts may need to be evacuated. So that um, so that that's kind of it's not going to be one one person making that decision. Uh, however, the sheriff's department, by state statute, is the only one that can order an evacuation. So we work in conjunction with the Sheriff's Department to make that determination. Um, you're going to hear the word code red um, thrown out tonight several times. That's something that, that uh, Lieutenant uh, Martin is going to be going over in a little bit later, so I won't go too far into it. But it, hopefully you're all um, registered through the county in code red. And if we had that information in your location, it makes it very easy for to contact you uh, through the telephone. But in that event, in the event that we make the determination that there's going to be an evacuation, um, you know, we coordinated it through all of us. And what does an evacuation mean? It's not mandatory, um, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, when we when we come, when you get a phone call, when we come knocking on your door, we're telling you to leave. What we're saying is, it's time. We want you to leave. We're making a very strong effort to get you out of the area because there's imminent danger. Um, if you choose not to leave, then the chances, the likelihood of you being um, rescued later on may diminish because we're the first part of the flooding stages. And as we get down, and I don't want to take anything that's going to be presented later, but as, as the river goes further down, it gets bigger and bigger, and there's more and more of a disaster. So we may become uh, your home. Uh, we only have a few resources available, helicopters, et cetera, to, to save people. And those resources may become diminished as the water rises. So that's, that's my pitch on please evacuate when we ask you to. It's not mandatory. Now, there's two exceptions. One is if, um, if an adult or a person does not have the, the faculties about them to make that decision, 
then we make that decision for them. And, um, and then we have to, if we believe that their life is in danger, it's up to us again by statute to remove them from the location. The same thing goes for juvenile. If we've decided that that this that it needs to be evacuated and there and there's a juvenile uh, in your home, uh, we will then uh, take the juvenile. Uh, so we're we're asking you to you know, to accompany them when we ask for an evacuation. Because when we when we ask for an evacuation, when we when we tell you that this area needs to be evacuated, it's because there's uh, you're in danger. Your, your, your life and property. Um, we'll have questions later on about that, and the <coughs> sheriff's department will go over that a little bit later as well. Um, so we have, and you'll see, you'll see on the maps here in a few minutes, kind of what uh, evacuation looks like, and and what precautions we'll take to protect your property while you're gone. Um, the the evacuation, I, I put it here, that it's going to be law enforcement driven, so. Um, if fire has time to help us, um, if, if public works has time to help us, they will all have some type of identification um, on. So if you see somebody wearing gang colors and you know throwing gang signs, asking to evacuate, uh, asking for their identification, it's most likely they're not supposed to be having you evacuate. Um, and then while you're gone, there will be barricades put up, uh, and there will be man barricades. So we will have our staff manning the barricades. So some of the things you want to make sure you take with you when you leave um, your residence is identification so that you can get back into your residence. You want to make sure that you um, take, maybe it's the next slide. Yeah, so you want to make sure that you have, um, uh, and I think Chief Moore mentioned a little bit, make sure you have your chargers, your telephones, your, your, your methods of communication. So that if we, if you put a telephone on code red, and we're going to be contacting you again through that, we want to make sure that you have that that with you and the ability. Also, of course, we'll be making uh, public service announcements. We'll be making uh, uh, information, providing information through other means, social media, and through the radio and uh, television, if at all possible. So that information can be obtained. Um, and we'll continue to give you updates as they uh, as they come. Um, make sure your whole family has identification. So if for some reason, you know, we start populating the area again, before we back in, we know who's you know. If you have a, a son that's working someplace else and they come back, we know they can identify who they are. Um, son or daughter, child, parent. Now, kind of a, 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 a protocol that, that I know Clarkdale's used in the past and maybe you're accustomed to is when you evacuate and the entire uh, residence is clear, if you can tie a white towel or a rag or something on the doorknob or the, or the door handle closest to the, to the road so that we can see as we're making our rounds, making sure that everyone's safe, that we can see, yeah, this house has been evacuated. That would be very beneficial to us as well. Also, when evacuating your home, be sure, please, to turn off your electricity and turn off your gas. If there's going to be a flood through that area and electricity or gas is left on, it just makes it that much more dangerous for first responders um, when we go through and clear, and clear out the area. Um, also, it can you know, cause major problems in your home as well if they aren't turned off. When we say turn off electricity, we're talking about it your electrical box. We say turn off the gas. We're talking about at your, um, you know, at the actual junction where you have a valve. Um, so you'd be shutting off that gas there as well. Um, in the event the routes are compromised, then we'll go over our routes. But, but a big one, of course, would be Bitter Creek Bridge. If for any reason it was compromised, we've kind of went over the different routes out of um, that portion of, of Clarkdale. We would want you to. Uh, the best thing, the only thing that I know would be to shelter in place um, when all other routes are, are, are compromised. So in, in sheltering in place, and we would need, we want to make sure that we communicate with you via telephone, um, and that's our best method of communication, 
And if there's no electricity, then of course we would start communicating with the town, with the with the area through whatever communications we had. And as those continued to diminish, then obviously we didn't have to use um, service, emergency services through helicopter and maybe even provide. If we have a helicopter or we have something available, provide whatever resources you need in that area. Now, I've been told, having only been here for, for four years, that usually um, when you have a major flooding area, it's within 24, 48 hours, the water starts to subside. And if that happens, then of course we'll be able to make it into um, that section of town within 48 hours. Now, do we have, before I go too far, too much into this, do we have very many people or do we have anybody from this section of town here yes. tonight? Okay, okay. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and, and go over some of the emergency evacuation routes. Next slide, please. So in, in this, this area, so now we're talking about over this way in, in town. Um, if, so you have several different, if these, uh, access areas are compromised as well as this area. This one seems to be compromised, you know, all the time. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, 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 I'm sorry. This is Old Jerome Highway, and this is State Route 89A. So, if you live in this area, as soon as you come off 89A, this is that first voice there. So, this one usually gets compromised first. It seems to be the one that I know most about being compromised. So if this one's compromised, and then these areas in here are just off of Lisa Street, you know, as you go into, uh, it says here, uh, sorry? Landing. Yeah, landing lane. So, and these are cohorts, is that? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, right. These are areas where there would be barricades because it's been compromised. So if, if both of these, if this section and this section is is compromised, and then this route here for for these houses would come through. We would open up the cemetery, and you'd be able to come out through the cemetery. Okay. However, even if they're both compromised, and you're living in this area, you can come out through uh, uh, going down through uh, uh, Rita Street, and then on, on out through uh, Paloma Way. Is there that clear? Okay. Okay, and then um, so Old Jerome Highway, what has between Lisa Street and Seeing Drive, again you can use along the way. Just no. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. people into your residence and 
when I get to your residential area. One thing I didn't cover is that we would man those barricades until the areas start becoming populated again. So once we contact you, once you're, once you're notified on the radio and we see that people are starting to come back in and populating their homes, um, they're safe to, to, to return to, then we'd be unmanning the barricades. So it's not like if you decide to take a vacation and you're gone for a week, we're not going to continue to you know, um, protect your, your residents other than what we normally do. Uh, when, when people start populating the area again, then we'll return hopefully to normal and to the next stage of cleanup.
on that line. The second number has been um, activated to uh, be manned so people can actually call in and that will be used. That will kind of be tag team between the town and the fire district as needed to serve whatever purpose doing, during an emergency. And these are just um, your local emergency contact numbers for you to get a hold of any of these uh, agencies should you need this type of help. Hi, I'm Kathy Bainbridge and I'm going to go over just real quickly a basic recovery on what the town is able to do. And you hear all the time emergency, you hear incident, you hear event, you hear disaster. We've seen a lot on the news just recently about all the snow on the East Coast and being a disaster, the flooding in New Jersey being a disaster. And not everything has to be a disaster. Um, a year and a half ago, we ran out of power, a transformer blew in the town of Clarkdale, and we happened to be hosting a forum in the auditorium that had about 100 people there. The train had a full train load of people. All the power was out for four or five hours. The restaurants weren't able to be working on Main Street, and some of the businesses had to run at a lower grid in order to be able to go. The town's telephone system was down. And so that wasn't a disaster, but it was an emergency. But it was just a small thing like a transformer that really affected a lot of different people in town. That happened to be a nice day out. If it would have been 100 degrees out and there was no power for four or five hours, or if it was really cold in, in this time of year and went down in the middle of the night, we have a whole different type of event and a whole different type of thing that everybody has to handle and the town has to think of. So we, we go through our emergency management training all around the circle so that we can think of even the smallest thing going wrong could be an emergency for quite a few people and a disaster for some just depending on you know if you lost power and you needed that power to have oxygen in your home or something else for life safety. So when we do have uh, an event, we watch, we watch how it builds. For the event that we think may happen with the flooding coming up, if and something happens and it gets to be beyond the town's capability of handling of ourselves, when we need help, then we go up the chain, we go to Yadapai County, and the county helps provide us mutual aid. They have equipment and they have manpower and they help us all along the way. When the county needs additional support, they're of course calling in the state. The whole time from the bottom of the chart up to the top of the chart, everybody is taking care and watching the dollar amounts and the dollar thresholds of the damage that is occurring both public to the town and the infrastructure and the buildings along with residential home and property damage because as we build up towards the presidential declaration, the majority of that is based on property damage dollar amounts. So as we go from the town to the county to the state, and then the state has to go to the president, and the president has to file a declaration, and once that happens, then we're coming from the top down so that the declaration and FEMA stepping in with help for both public and private goes down through the state to the county and then down to the town. So there's no step, steps in between that you, skip, that you skip along the way. So we're, we're in the recovery mode now of this. The response in some parts may be happening because as the, the first response area is starting to get into recovery and as you go down, the last response areas are still probably responding, which would be Clarkdale into Cottonwood and the beginning of Cottonwood, farther up the Sycamore Canyon. So we have a lot of different things going on at the same time. So the primary goal of our disaster response is to return the impacted area back to normal. The problem is normal is different to everybody. So we try to get back to as normal as we need to get immediately and 
the short-term recovery consists of the emergency and urgent measures to keep the roads open, to keep water flowing, to keep the sewer going, to keep the power on, and to make sure that people have a place to stay that is safe and warm and dry, along with their pets and large animals at the same time. And those are all life safety measures, and we focus on those as immediately as fast as possible. Those are our priorities. In the long-term recovery, then we're moving on to the debris removal, fixing our streets and our bridges, and then going into the wastewater sewer plants for the things to keep them fixed. Once we get a presidential declaration, when we get the presidential de declaration, then FEMA allows for individual assistance and for homes that are not insured. That's why you would want to have your flood insurance also. Um, and it's meant to help with critical expenses that can't be covered up in other ways. And it's not intended to be like your normal homeowner's insurance. FEMA's not going to come in and put your house back to exactly the way it was. They will help you. They have repair assistance also for structural parts of your home, along with water and sewer. Most of the assistance from the federal government is in the is in, is in low interest loans. So you can't think, well, FEMA's going to come in and take care of me, so I don't need to worry about this. You have to be able to help yourself by having home insurance, flood insurance, and keeping track of all of that. FEMA also then for responding communities has public assistance and that's the funding that they will help recuperate the expenses that the town went through, the county went through, the state went through in order to get our infrastructure and roads back together, our buildings back up, our phone systems up, our water and wastewater treatment areas back up. They will help us and reimburse us but only if there's a federal disaster and that's why we need to keep track of all of those dollar amounts from the very beginning because we have to apply for them and we have to have all the documentation in order to get that. For the town of Clarkdale applying, helping people out, the type of event and the type of recovery and the type of assistance we get to help will all depend on what we're able to do with you. Our main goal is to collect and distribute all of the information that we can get that can help you and to let you know how to apply for that and, and let you know what's available and just give you the information as best we can so that you are able to get FEMA help if you need it or county help or sheltering help or state help. So just depending on how large the event is and what we're able to recover helps us to be able to help you recover at the same time. Good evening. Um, as you can see, I'm John Simon with the uh, yeah, Pike County Office of Emergency Management. Um, what I'm going to discuss with you this evening is a little bit about some of the things that the county does on behalf of residents and in support for local jurisdictions uh, during the event of an emergency or disaster. Uh, the person that work in the office are Mr. Denny Folk. He is the county emergency manager. Uh, he was able to be here this evening. He is doing uh, some education in another jurisdiction, helping them out. Uh, Mr. Hugh Valley, who is the deputy director, and Marcy Slade, who does recovery and finance, and then myself, I do planning and uh, vulnerability assessments and training. This right here is kind of a key concept in this whole discussion. Um, the Appalachian County Board of Supervisors, during the process of our development of the emergency operations plan for the county, made the decision that we will operate under the one county concept. And what this means to you, the folks that are on the ground, in the event of an emergency, wherever that is, the total weight of what the county can provide as far as resources, whatever we can draw from the resource allocation or whatever we have at our immediate disposal, will be put to the task. In other words, we're not going to reserve an extra dump truck so that we can make sure we get, you know, stands to the kids' playground. 
we're going to bring to bear everything that we have to get things done. So one of the discussions that we're going to have is the sheltering process. That's something that always comes into play during a significant disaster. Um, we talk about calculable percentages. This is from the stance of the folks that are you know, managing these incidents and how we plan for and prepare to help people. Um, one of the things that we discuss is the 10% rule. 10% rule means that 10% roughly of your evacuated population will utilize the shelter. So when we're doing our planning, and preparing for that, getting you know food and all the things that are going to be associated with sheltering operation, that's how we base that decision. That information is what goes to or comes from, depending on how it's received from the American Red Cross Salvation Army and other volunteer organizations that are active in disaster. That are these groups right here, we turn them as BOAS. Um, we have these folks that operate in our EOC, so they are present at the beginning of the incident until the completion of the incident or as we did. Uh, these are just some of the groups that we do utilize. Um, Faith-based organizations are very, very good groups of folks, and they do a variety of things above and beyond just simply providing food and clothing and things like that. They do um, home repair, rebuilding, things of that nature. There's a ton of things that they provide. Shelter and location is one of our biggest challenges. Um, as you guys have been seeing with some of the mapping and things that we're looking at, there's possibility of what we call isolation or zoning or islands. There's many terms that we use. That's important to understand when we're trying to identify locations because setting a shelter inside one of those islands would be counterproductive. That also comes into play with it as first responders who are defining some of your evacuation routes. So it's kind of a big picture concept of how that's being evaluated. Um, there's always going to be a process of certification for these kind of shelters. We have to manage, when we're looking at these, we're thinking on a grander scale of the total population that we're going to be encountering. Um, access and functional needs, that's something that's um, directly um, is going to need support of things. Um, folks that may have um, issues, say we had to evacuate a hospital. That's kind of a unique circumstance of what those people are going to need to have provided to them. So all of that goes into calculation, which is done through the American Red Cross. Access and egress, that really applies to not only folks being able to get there, but also emergency medical services. Once people are there, are they going to need to have support while they're there and be able to get the first responders in to help and take care of things? Security is always important. People that um, are going to be in there, they need to be secure, they need to be safe to make sure that things are being provided for. Law enforcement generally supports that function and make sure that those things are addressed. Communications, um, we discussed earlier um, that there is a communication process that is ongoing. Um, one of the things that occurs during that communication is how information exchange occurs. Um, as the town receives information, they are putting it out to the populace, we receive it at the county. That's then sent to the state, and there's kind of a global concept of communication of what's happening, trying to keep it as real time as possible. Those communications are initiated in the field with first responders, so we may have the sheriff's incident management team out on the ground. They are the eyes on. They are talking to the town, they're talking to the county, and those communication lines are open consistently. Some of the other things that we'll bring or be able to provide is the Area Juracies Group. That is an alternate means of communication utilizing ham radio. Um, so they have the ability to talk throughout the state, nationally, globally, if they chose to. So communication is always ready, if you will, in that capacity. When we activate the EOC in the event of a disaster, they are dispatched with us and in place generally within an hour. So there is always some form of communication. They have the ability to reach out to the individual. They can reach out to um, first response organizations, statewide and to media, and they can do that both digitally and through traditional comms. We discussed some of this already with access and functional needs. So these are things that we're considering during the process of defining shelter and also what we're going to need and where it's going to be. So this is just some general information. Okay, how we coordinate that at the county level is we have the coordination through the ESF-6 and ESF-8. That stands for Emergency Support Function. Those are just designations that we use inside of the EOC so we know we're talking to. As you can see there, they're defined by mass care and medical. Those are their specific functions. Generally, these are going to be people with the American Red Cross, Salvation Army, or very specialized folks, maybe with public health. Um, they're going to be doing some things regarding those, those subject matters of mass care. We provide logistical support. 
one of the things that came up was the concept of the need of power. Let's say that there's a loss of the grid and we need to make sure that folks are being addressed and getting those things that they need. One of the things that our logistics does is as they receive information from the field, our incident management teams that are on the ground, we have power outages in town, we have power outages in a certain residential neighborhood. The logistics division of our EOC, um, they will get together with um, their folks, which can be at the state level, it can also be county to county. And we utilize what's called the MAP system, which is multi-agency coordination. And that's where we begin to bring in resources from other locations to support those things. Um, at the end of the day, our focus is always going to be on the lifelines, um, what is also termed as critical infrastructure. We need to make sure that you have power, you need transportation, you need all of your utility concerns met, and communications. <clears throat> State coordination happens also at the EOC from the emergency manager. He coordinates with DEMA, Department of Emergency and Military Affairs, and they act as a support function. So in a simplistic view, um, as you saw in the other one, kind of the upside down funnel, um, from the uh, from a simple view, that is the town of Clarkdale, they may have their EOC activated in place. The county's job is to support local efforts. So at the county EOC, we're not um, showing, you know, Lieutenant Martin have to evacuate a building, we're not helping Chief North put fires out. We are making sure they have the resources that they need to serve you. That's the whole objective of what the EOC does, and it's a, it's a building block process. So you have the town's EOC, the county's EOC, the state's EOC, all the way up to the federal level. So it's a singular line of communication. It helps with efficiency and making sure that there's not redundancy. Okay, I just said all that. <laughs> all right. Some of the resources that we have immediately in the Public Works Division, that's on a county-wide scale. So we can draw resources from all over the county. If you have an incident in Clarkville, we can get, it, we can get tools and equipment and resources from the area around there, down around Black Canyon City, from Saligna. We can bring those resources countywide. GIS and mapping systems, uh, Town Clarkville does have that in-house, but we have the ability to support them. If they need something more, maybe it's even hands, bringing some folks in that can help them get things done in a more timely manner. We bring resources. Uh, flood control, mapping, water course, and all the data associated. We'll have some slides in here that will give you information that you can go to and take a look at if you'd like to gather the information yourself or try to get up to date. And we discussed the logistics of the So here are some of the items. We have Pike County Office of Emergency Management. That is our website and our direct line that goes into the office. That is County Flood Control. We have the Cognitive Office there listed. And the two websites, this, uh, I believe the top one, if I'm not mistaken, is just a general website. And then this here, as you can see, says flood hazard status reports. There's GIS and informational systems. What these things do if you go to these online is you have the ability to, to go through a specific location, even your own home, and take a look at some mapping and things associated, and develop some data and information for yourself. Um, they have an email, uh, telephone number, and both the Cotton and uh, Public Works Division, same information again on the Prescott Cotton side, their contact information. So, in summary, basically what the county does is we support the folks that are getting the job done. Um, the emergency manager, Denny Folk, one of the things that he likes to add into all of his conversations, especially in my training process that I'm going through, is what does emergency management do at the end of the day? Why do we exist? Anybody want to take a shot at that? We exist for you. Our job is about people. That's what we do day in and day out. Everything we do. Whether it be trying to help support a location financially, whether it be providing resources to the folks that need it, or whether it be us getting some folks out there to help you dig out the driveway. That's what we do. And that's what all of these folks are here for. Every single one. We support you. We appreciate you and your support of us. So that's what the county emergency management does. So that's it. Thank you. Hello. I'm Lieutenant Martin, and I'm in charge of the Eastern Area Command. That's basically everything this side of the uh, Mingus Mountain. There's our different divisions broken up, Eastern, Northern, and Southern. What I'm here to talk to you about is primarily evacuations and the code grid. My role in evacuations is, is I'm in charge of all of the search and rescue. Not only am I in charge of the Verde Valley, but I'm also in charge of 
all of Yavapai County in relation to um, search and rescue and coordinating those efforts. We have a lot of volunteers that are trained. Um, we have the Jeep Posse, we have the 4x4, even we have dogs. We have a uh, backcountry unit that's swift water. They work with the fire departments and doing rescues and things of that nature. I coordinate all those. So all that leads into is our Code Red system. The Code Red system wasn't necessary 10 years ago. Um, everyone had a landline. If I need to get word out to you guys to evacuate, all I had to do was call, do a reverse system on our 911, and I could get you guys the message. That's not the case anymore. The majority of homes do not have a landline. The only way that I can call you, if you have a cell phone, the cell phone is your only form of communication, is if you register your phone number with your address at the website. Okay. If you don't have access to a computer, you can call the sheriff's office. Um, one of my office secretaries will be happy to take down your information, and they will register it for you. You can get alerts in many different ways. You can get it through text. You can get it through email. You can get it however you choose. There's about four or five different ways that you can get it on there. The process during evacuation, we've talked, you heard a little bit about tying the white sheet on there. All that's very applicable and definitely saves resources. The benefit that you guys have is you're at the top of the list in the in the flood in the floodplain here for the Verde River. Clarkdale's the highest town along the Verde River, short of Perkinsville. Um, and Perkinsville takes us about five minutes to evacuate. We just go up and knock on the door and say, "Hey, how do you go?" <laughs> um, then the rest of you guys, are, you know, then you're down from there. So the, the benefit that you have with that is is that you'll receive the first round of notifications. Um, the, Another big benefit we have is all the flood gauges that are installed along all the waterways. We have our flood coordinator, Dan Cherry. He constantly monitors the weather patterns and everything else. The floods don't happen in, in a matter of minutes. They happen over, you know, they look at the weather patterns. They look at the stuff. A lot of them are forecastable. When they start developing a weather pattern that they get concerned with, they start watching it. They put us on standby. They let us know. And so we'll be calling you before the power goes out. Now, communication once the power goes out, if, you know, chances are when the power goes down, the landlines are going to go with it. Um, a lot of times those travel along the same routes. So if you have a cell phone, it may or may not be working. That's where the radio, if you've got it, we will do in the broadcast over that. And we will, you know, last chance we will be coming around to your house doing notices that way as well. Um, the roadblocks, once they go up, we will be doing, you know, in fire situations, that's what I have a lot of experience with over on the Prescott side, Yarnell, everything else. I, I was there, I helped direct those scenarios. I can tell you how the evacuation procedures work there, and I can tell you how we hold your neighborhood safe until it's safe for you to come back in. Um, you heard Chief Taylor talking about, you know, once the danger was over, that they weren't going to ban the roadblocks. Traditionally, we usually hold those roadblocks for up to about a day afterwards, just not to let people flood back into your neighborhood. So that in the event that you did evacuate and there was some kind of stuff to your house, we will secure that or we will assist them in securing your residences for about 24 hours once it's safe to come back in. And we'll usually hold those roadblocks and not allow anybody that doesn't have identification into those areas. So that it just prevents the, the looters from coming back through and trying to get to your stuff. If you if you got enough common sense to get out.